Good morning, and welcome to Grace Valley Christian Center's Adult Sunday School. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, your word declares that if we love you, we will obey you. And it also tells us that we only love because you first loved us. Father, we are amazed at that love. And we pray that you would help us as we study this marvelous doctrine of the atonement or redemption accomplished, that you would give us greater love for you, and that that greater love would issue forth in greater obedience. To your glory we pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing on in our study of John Murray's book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, and I'll begin with a brief review of the previous session, but a quick one. The sessions are up on the web uh, in general right after they're done, pretty much, within a couple days. So you can go, if you've missed one or whatever, you can go watch the video on the web. So what have we talked about so far? We've said that the accomplishment of redemption, or the atonement, you can call it, is central to the Christian religion. Without it, there is no Christian religion. <laughs> Uh, this is what it's all about. God chose to save a people for himself, and this is the means by which he did so. And we are currently discussing the necessity of the atonement, and we've established a number of things. So far, we've established that the source of the atonement was God's love, and that Adam's sin plunged man into bondage as our federal head, and it plunged us into death. Both physical and eternal resulted from that bondage. We've established that sinful man cannot redeem himself. This is not possible. But God freely chose from eternity past to save some. So we've also discussed the fact that many people have denied the necessity of the atonement, or even in some cases the very fact of the atonement. And these liberal views are not reconcilable with the scripture and come ultimately from a denial of the authority and or the reliability of the scriptures. And I showed that cartoon from 1922, I think it was, with the staircase coming down. And the, the first step was a denial of the authority of the word of God. That is a very fundamental point. That was not a slippery slope fallacy, as I pointed out, because there's a causal connection between denying the authority and the infallibility of the word of God and leading yourself straight into varying degrees of agnosticism and ultimately atheism. Because if all of us have some ultimate authority, as we pointed out, and our ultimate authority should be the Word of God, um, we have to have some ultimate way of deciding what is true and what is not true. And if it isn't the Word of God, then it's going to be human reason, either mine or somebody else's. Martin Luther made the point that there are two different ways of using the human reason. We can use it in a magisterial sense, as a magistrate standing in judgment over the word of God and saying, well, this part I think is right, this part I don't think is right, so I'm now the authority, I'm God. Or we can use it in a ministerial way in service of the word of God, trying to come to a true understanding of what it is God is communicating to us in this revelation. And that's the proper use of human reason. It does not mean to be credulous. It does not mean to be thoughtless. It does not mean to put your brain away. Quite the contrary, it's the greatest use of our intellect to try and think God's thoughts after him and understand what it is he has told us about the nature of man, the nature of God, and the salvation. So the atonement was necessary. The necessity of the atonement is an essential doctrine of biblical Christianity. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And Wayne Grudem addresses the necessity of the atonement in chapter 27 of his systematic theology, and he offers a couple of good arguments that are not adduced by Murray in, in favor of just the necessity of the atonement, and I thought two of them would be worth bringing up. In Matthew 26, 39, Jesus prayed, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Now, we know that Jesus always prayed in the will of God. And we know that his prayers were always efficacious. So we can conclude that if in fact it had been possible for this cup to be taken away from him, it would have been, but it wasn't. It was necessary. And then secondly, in speaking to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus said, 
was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And it was a conclusion that Jesus reached from the Old Testament scriptures as he opened the word of God to them and showed them from the Old Testament everything that was said about himself. So those are, I think, two fairly powerful arguments for the necessity of the atonement. They don't necessarily address the issue of what type of necessity, which we'll get to in a bit. So we've looked briefly at some of the liberal theories of the atonement and presented some arguments that were opposed to them and that are not in Murray's book. So now let's turn to Murray's book and start following fairly closely the material in chapter one. So Murray examines the two most important answers that have been given to this question by Bible-believing Christians. And those are called the hypothetical necessity and a consequent absolute necessity. So what is meant by those phrases? Well, the phrase hypothetical necess necessity actually goes back to Aristotle. And it means that which is necessary on the condition or on the hypothesis that the end is to be obtained. And I took that from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. In this case, we have to understand we're talking about the type of necessity, so it's not just the end to be obtained, the fact that there should be redemption, but it's the way in which that was accomplished that we're talking about here as being the hypothesis, all right? A consequent absolute necessity, on the other hand, is something that is absolutely necessary as a consequence of something else. So in this case, the fact that Christ's substitutionary death is a necessary consequence of God having chosen to save anybody that there wasn't some other way this could be accomplished. That's what's meant by the consequent necess absolute necessity. There was not another way to accomplish it, but it wasn't necessary that it be accomplished at all. That was God's free sovereign choice. All right? So this view, this hypothetical necessity, we'll look at briefly. This view says that there is nothing inherent in the nature of God or the remission of sin that makes a blood atonement essential. All right? The necessity arose only because God chose to accomplish it this way, but he could have done it some other way. And there's all kinds of different shades of this view and different ways of looking at this. In his systematic theology, Burkhoff says this view has been held by some very great Christians, including St. Augustine, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Bavinck, and at, some point, at one point Owens, although he changed his view. And therefore, the type of necessity whether it's a hypothetical necessity or a consequent absolute necessity, is certainly not an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. Now, it turns out, in looking at some of these writers myself, I'm not sure that Burkhoff is completely right here. They opposed an absolute or a simple necessity. They did not oppose, because the terminology hadn't been used before Murray, I don't believe, a consequent absolute necessity. And as we'll see in a minute, I think some of them probably would have agreed with Murray on that. <laughs> So what did Calvin write? Well, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he wrote, it deeply concerned us that he who was to be our mediator should be very God and very man. If the necessity be inquired into, it was not what is commonly termed simple or absolute, but flowed from the divine decree. So there's the hypothetical. It was hypothetically necessary on the basis of God's having decreed, okay? from the divine decree on which the salvation of man depended. What was best for us, our most merciful Father determined. We'll come back to that in a minute, what was best for us. But the main concern of Calvin and others was to uphold the sovereign free will of God. They didn't want to have us using our puny little intellects and saying, well, God had to do it this way. God couldn't do that. He had to have done this. You know, and that is a very dangerous place to go. We don't want to put ourselves in that position. But as we'll see, that's not what we're doing. All right, so let's do a little aside here on God's perfection for a minute. The scriptures tell us that God is perfect and that all he does is perfect. And there are a number of other scriptures we could list, but let's just look at three. He is the rock. His works are perfect, Deuteronomy 32.4. And as for God, his way is perfect, Psalm 18.30. And then in Matthew 5.48, we're told, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So think about this for a minute. Given that all God's ways are perfect, it seems that God is bound in some sense by his perfection to use the best means possible to accomplish a particular end. Now this does not limit his sovereign will, but it recognizes that he always wills to do that which is 
best. So when Calvin said God would determine the best way, I would say that maybe Calvin would have agreed with the idea of a consequent absolute necessity, although he was opposed to a simple or absolute necessity. I don't know because I can't go ask Calvin. Um, Herman Bavink also seems to mostly agree with this view. He wrote that the atonement as a way of satisfying God's justice may be called necessary, not as a necessity that is imposed on God from without and from which he cannot escape, but as actions that are in agreement with his attributes, I would say including his perfection, and display them most splendidly. And he goes on to write, if God wanted to reveal himself in his consummate glory, then the creation and recreation, meaning redemption, and of course everything that follows from that, Christ's incarnation and satisfaction were necessary. His perfections were already made manifest in creation, but they are much more richly and superbly displayed in the recreation. So it seems that Bavink uh, might well have supported Murray's consequent absolute necessity as well. And this is what Murray calls the classic Protestant position, although he, although he doesn't then go on to list who all held it. So I'm not sure who he thought held the view. In his book on the atonement of Christ, Francis Turretin, uh, who was a 17th century theologian, writes that the necessity of the atonement makes a glorious display of the most illustrious of the divine perfections. And he goes on to look at four of them here. First, of his holiness. So how does it display his holiness? On account of which he can have no communion with the sinner until by an atonement his guilt is removed and his pollution purged. And then it makes a glorious display of his justice, which, is inexorably, which inexorably demands punishment of sin. It makes a glorious display of his wisdom in reconciling the respective claims of justice and mercy, and of his love in not sparing his own son in order that he might spare us. So I think this is a wonderful passage. It gives us a little tiny bit of an idea into realizing that this way of accomplishing the atonement was the perfect way for God to make manifest his glory in all of its multifaceted nature. Murray explains, getting now to the consequent absolute necessity, Murray explains the word consequent in this designation points to the fact that God's will or decree to save any is of free and sovereign grace. So we are not in any way limiting God's free sovereign will here. Again, it's only absolutely necessary as a consequence of his having decided to accomplish this. The terms absolute necessity, however, indicate that God, having elected some to everlasting life out of his mere good pleasure, do you recognize the, the phrasing of the shorter catechism here? Um, was under the necessity of accomplishing this purpose through the sacrifice of his own son, a necessity arising from the perfections of his own nature. So is this vain speculation? Are we doing something that we should not be doing here in light of Deuteronomy 29, 29, which says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, all right, but the things revealed to us and our children? So are we violating that in some way by, by diving into trying to figure out was this absolutely necessary of God? Or should we just back up and say, well, we just believe what the Bible says and don't go any further, which is always a good stance. But let's look at what Murray says here. He says it might appear to be vainly speculative and presumptuous to press such an inquiry and to try to determine what is inherently necessary for God. But it is not presumptuous for us to say that certain things are inherently necessary or impossible for God. It belongs to our faith to avow that he cannot lie. The scriptures themselves tell us God cannot lie. The scriptures themselves tell us God cannot be unfaithful. The scriptures tell us a number of things God cannot do. You know, the old theologians used to get into all sorts of silly arguments. You know, can God make a rock so large that God can't move it? That's just silliness. Of course God cannot make a rock so large that God cannot move it, but it's a silly argument. But nonetheless, there are things that we can say God can't do or won't do, however you want to put it. And so Murray says the real question is, does the scripture provide us with evidence or considerations on the basis of which we may conclude that this, meaning the atonement, 
is one of the things impossible or necessary for God to have accomplished the atonement in this particular way. And St. Anselm of Cater Canterbury, who was an 11th century theologian, was, as nearly, was one of the early scholastic Christian philosophers. And the scholastics in general are not people that I would quote or look at. If you read Calvin's Institutes, he, he excoriates them over and over and over again. He usually calls them the schoolmen. And of course, the, the scholastics were mostly epitomized by Thomas Aquinas, who came nearly 200 years after Anselm. But Anselm was the earliest one. And he did write some good things. He wrote a book called Curdeus Homo, which is why God became man. That has some really strange stuff in it, but it has some useful things. But the main point I'm bringing him up was his motto was fides querens intellectum, which means faith in search of understanding. And Thomas Williams writes that this motto really means something like an active love of God seeking a deeper knowledge of God. And that's what we're doing here. We don't want to be questioning God in the sense of saying, is what you've done just, or do I agree with it, or any of these things. We want to question God from the point of view of saying, I want a deeper understanding of my Creator and my Redeemer and my God so that I can love Him better and obey Him better. All right, so Murray's arguments. He's, he says that the six arguments that he presents in favor of a consequent absolute necessity must be viewed in their cumulative effect rather than individually. Although I think there are several of them that are extremely powerful on their own merits, when you put all six together, I think the case is pretty well closed. Um, so he says, you know, you've really got to look at all six. If you think one of them is a little bit weak, don't get too bothered by that. So he makes six arguments. The first argument is that there are those passages in Scripture, of course, which create a very strong presumption in favor of this inference, again, of the idea of a consequent absolute necessity. And let's examine two of the verses that he gives as examples, Hebrews 2.10 and 17. And he uses Hebrews a lot, of course, because of all the books in the Bible. Hebrews is the one that most clearly speaks of this idea of a new covenant and of all of the sacrificial system of the Old Covenant being typology that pointed forward to Christ, and of Christ being the priest of a new covenant, and the sacrifice of the new covenant, and this is a better covenant, and all of these things. So we use Hebrews a lot. And in Hebrews 2.10 it says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. So it was fitting. It was, it was a proper way for God to do this. And God, of course, always does things in the right way. It's a presumption in favor of this. It gets a lot stronger in Hebrews 2.17. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Now read just the words I underlined. He had to be made in order that he might make atonement. He had to be. It was necessary. Having decided to atone, it was necessary that God do it this way. So these verses strongly imply that it was necessary that redemption be accomplished this way. Now Murray's second argument is that there are passages such as John 3, 14 to 16. You all know 16, but you probably don't remember 14 and 15. We'll get there in a second. Which rather definitely suggests that the alternative to the giving of God's only begotten Son and His being lifted up on the accursed tree is the eternal perdition, in other words, the eternal damnation, the eternal punishment of the lost. We can hardly escape the additional thought that there is no other alternative. So let's take a look at John 3:14 through 16. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Everyone who believes in him may have, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life, and then we get to John 3.16, which is familiar. So in other words, just as Moses in that Old Testament story lifted up the snake on a pole that people could look to that and be healed, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Again, it's being stated as though there's no alternative to this. All right? So this passage certainly seems to suggest that there was no alternative available. Murray's third argument, well, he argues that the gravity of sin itself, the, the, the gravity of our sin and rebellion against God, which I think is something you can never think about too much because we don't grasp 
how wicked and terrible and awful our own sin is. All right, we'll talk about that more. But the gravity of sin required a sacrifice that only Christ, the unique God-man, could offer. And here we look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 to 23, where he's talking about the old tabernacle on earth, and he says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things, in other words, the things in the earthly tabernacle, right? They were copies of the heavenly. It was necessary for them to be purified with these sacrifices, speaking of the blood of animals. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Have you ever stopped at that verse and, and, and said, wait a minute, whoa, what is this saying? This is saying that the heavenly things themselves had to be purified with a sacrifice. Why would something in heaven need to be purified? Isn't heaven perfect? Yes, it is. Why, why would something in heaven need to be purified? Because it didn't start out in heaven. What are the heavenly things that he's referring to in this verse? Well, the heavenly things are the people of God, the kingdom of God. And they, must, they are not fit for heaven until their sins have been atoned for. And that requires something, as Hebrews argues at length, much better than the blood of bulls and goats and rams, which were fulfilling the law that God had given as a type to point forward to Christ, but they didn't actually cleanse anyone's consciences, as we're told. The blood of Christ was what was essential for that. And we're told in Hebrews 10, verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And here we see it listed as a past tense, but you know, being made holy, being sanctified, being saved, all of these things can be spoken of in the past, the present, or the future. There's a sense in which I have been saved by being born again. I am being saved in God's working with me for my sanctification, and I will be saved on that glorious day when I'm made perfect. We're told in Hebrews 12 about the souls of just men made perfect in the presence of God. And so I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. I have been made holy, I am being made holy, I will be made holy. All right? But this is talking about the fact that the blood of Christ was essential to purify the people of God to be able to come into God's presence in heaven. Now, the nature of this better sacrifice is shown clearly in a couple of other passages in Hebrews, and we could go on with many. I encourage you to go home and just read through the book of Hebrews with these thoughts in mind. But in Hebrews 1.3, we read, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. We're told in John 1 that Christ exegetes the Father to us. He is the perfect image of God as man. It's like saying you have a painting can be a perfect image of somebody on a canvas. It's not the actual person, but it's the best you can possibly do on a canvas. Well, Christ is the best you can possibly do to represent God in human form because he is God. He's God and man. But we don't see God, he's invisible. We see Christ. Well, we don't even see him right now. We see him by faith, but we will, and people did. All right. So he's the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, so there's his purpose, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And of course, Hebrews makes the point, the earthly priests never sat down. They went into the tabernacle and did what they had to do and came back out. They weren't to sit down in there because their work was never finished. Christ finished. And so he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. What did he say from the cross? To Telestai, it is finished. For this reason, Hebrews 2.17, for this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, arguing about the necessity of God becoming man to pay the penalty for the sins of men. And finally, in Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And we'll come back to this passage in a little bit. 
So he further points out that the Levitical sacrifices are presented in, as presented in Hebrews 9, as, or are, I'm sorry, are presented in Hebrews 9 as mere patterns of the heavenly exemplar, the transcendent blood offering by which the heavenly things were purified. And Murray states, the necessity of blood shedding in the Levitical ordinance is simply a necessity arising from the necessity of blood shedding in the higher realm of the heavenly. So God established all of the earthly sacrifices to point forward to Christ only because the blood shedding was necessary to accomplish redemption in the first place through Christ. And so he established the sacrificial system as, a, as an image of that, as a type of that, to point forward to the heavenly reality. And then Murray asks on this argument, he says, so, you know, that says it's necessary, but what kind of necessity is it? So he says, what kind of necessity is this that obtained in the realm of the heavenly? Was it merely hypothetical or was it an absolute necessity? Could God have chosen to do this in some other way or did he have to do it this way? And he then gives three sub-arguments to support his contention that bloodshedding was an absolute necessity in the heavenly realm, which is what is ultimately what we're talking about here. So his first sub-argument, he said, speaking about the passage in Hebrew, passages in Hebrews 9, Murray writes, the emphasis of the context is that the transcendent efficacy of Christ's sacrifice is required by the exigencies arising from sin. So in other words, those things that are true because of sin. And these exigencies are not hypothetical. They are absolute. And to fully appreciate what he's saying, we must consider the typological symbology used in the Old Testament and then go back and look at the New Testament passages we just saw again very briefly. So let me do this. But again, I encourage you to go home and do this because it takes real thought and reflection to, to get this right. So what about the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Well, first of all, it was in the middle of the Israelite camp, right? Because what is central? God. The Bible begins in the beginning, God. All through, it's talking about God. And at the end, it's all about God. Everything is for his glory, from him and to him and through him are all things. So it's all about God, and he was central to the Israelite camp. Then when you come into the tabernacle, when you walk into the courtyard of the tabernacle, what was the first thing you saw? The bronze altar. Why? Because we're sinners. We have rebelled against God. We cannot come into his presence willy-nilly. There, there needs to be an altar. There needs to have been a sacrifice for us to come into his presence. And then when you went into the tabernacle itself, which you couldn't do, by the way, unless you were a priest, but when you went into the tabernacle itself, what was first there? The holy place. Only the priests went in there, and they went in there to change the showbread, to, to keep the incense burning, and so forth. All right? But they never sat down in there. And there was a curtain, and what was behind the curtain was the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And the ark of the testimony contained the law. That was what was behind the temple the curtain in the most holy place. And the ark contained the law and some other things, and it had a solid gold atonement cover with the cherubim carved onto the edge, overshadowing the atonement cover. And we're told in the Old Testament that God met with the high priest in the cloud above the atonement cover. And the high priest went in only once a year, and only on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and only with blood. Blood, first of all, for his own sins, and for the sins of the people. And what's the symbology? He goes into the Holy of Holies, only once a year, and he puts, sprinkles blood on the mercy seat. God appears above the mercy seat in a cloud. He looks downward toward the law, which we have broken, and in between he sees the atonement cover, the mercy seat with the blood on it. So it's covering our having broken the law. It's covering our sins. That's the symbology here. And the atonement cover or the mercy seat is central to this typology and it's very interesting. It was the top of the ark, as we just said, and in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, and then also again in Hebrews 9.5 written in the Greek, it's called the helasterion. That's the Greek word for the mercy seat or the atonement cover. All right? And the interesting thing about that is when you look in Romans 3.25, Paul writes, God presented him, is what it says, but it's referring to Christ. God presented Christ 
as a sacrifice of atonement. And the word sacri- the, the phrase sacrifice of atonement there, which can also be written in propitiation, this is the NIV, propitiation is what's used in the King James or the ESV. That phrase, sacrifice of atonement, translates that same Greek word, hilasterion. Christ is the mercy seat. Christ is the atonement cover. So the symbology is that he went in by his own blood, and then he is what God sees when he looks at us. He sees we are clothed, we're told, in the righteousness of Christ. So it is Jesus himself and his blood that offer the ultimate propitiation or atonement typified by the atonement cover and the ark in the Old Testament. So now reconsider one of those passages, 9, 11 through 12. When Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. So this is all talking about the heavenly transaction that is taking place here. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves because that's not efficacious. But he entered the most holy place once for all, and now the most holy place means into the presence of God himself, not just into the most holy place of the tabernacle where God appears in the cloud, but the true most holy place, the throne room of God in heaven. And he entered there once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, and he sat down. Praise God, because the job is done. It's completed. All right, the second sub-reason or sub-argument that Murray gives here for the absolute necessity is he says the precise nature of Christ's priestly offering and the efficacy of his sacrifice are bound up with the constitution of his person. You can't separate these things. The necessity and the efficacy of the sacrifice are bound up with who Christ is as the eternal God-man, the unique God-man. In other words, Hebrews argues that the superior nature of the heavenly exemplar, Christ, and his work, on which the earthly tabernacle and sacrifices were patterned, points to the need for the unique God-man to be both priest and sacrifice. And so you can go back and look again at Hebrews 1.3 and Hebrews 9.23. Hebrews 1.3 that we read before says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. We talked about that sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So this is speaking of this heavenly transaction on which the earthly tabernacle and its services were patterned. And then in Hebrews 9, 22 to 23, again, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things, i.e. the things in the earthly sanctuary, to be purified with these sacrifices, namely those of animals, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Praise God. Okay, the third sub-argument that Murray gives for this being a necessity, an absolute necessity, is if the sacrifice of Christ is only hypothetically necessary, then something's going to follow, right? Then the heavenly things in connection with which it had relevance and meaning were also only hypothetically necessary. And that is surely a difficult hypothesis, he says. So in other words, if God chose to save some, then the intimate connection between those who are saved and the person and work of Christ our Savior, as presented in Hebrews, shows that the atonement is necessary. And I really encourage you to go home and sit down with the book of Hebrews and just read it all through at one sitting and read it through with this whole idea in mind, that this book is is, is a unique book in the Bible in terms of describing to us the heavenly reality upon which the earthly patterns have been set, and that they're all pointing forward to this heavenly reality of Christ and the atonement that is ours in Christ. And of course, the point is that we would persevere in the faith, right? So, to apply today's teaching, we're gonna, I'm going to try and end each session now with a quick little thing for what you should do for application and what you should do to prepare for the next session. So in applying today's teaching, meditate on the fact that the source of our redemption is God's eternal love. And then consider, and here I had a hard time. You should take a concordance sometime, especially if you have one on, on a computer, and look for the word love. 
There are lots and lots and lots and lots of verses in the New Testament and elsewhere I could have pulled out to use here. I chose these for a particular reason. These are from 1 John 3, 14 and 16, where we read, we know that we have passed from death to life. In other words, what? We know we have been saved. We know we have been born again. Okay, we've passed from death to life. And of course, that's the point of 1 John. How do you know that you have been born again? How can you test yourself it's to see that you're not fooling yourself? Because in Matthew 7, 22, we're told that many will come to Christ on that day and say, Lord, Lord, and hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. So how do we know? And John writes, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. This is how we know what love is. So now he goes from telling us, okay, you have to have this love. Now he tells us something about that love. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That's a pretty high calling, folks, a pretty high calling. And we shouldn't try to spiritualize it and just say, well, it's just talking about a really great love. It is talking about a great love, but it's really honestly talking about laying down your life because it's saying surrender yourself. You're not the most important thing. Think about the people around you first. Think about God first, the people around you second, and yourself last, right? Humble yourself. That's the key here. True love looks to the good of the other, not yourself. So think about those things, meditate on those things, read through Hebrews, and I think you will profit greatly by doing so. And then to prepare for next time, you should read up to page 29 in Murray's book. Page 29, he starts a new little section on that page, so read up to that section. So we're going to finish next time with chapter 1, which is on the necessity of the atonement, and we're going to start into chapter 2, which is on the nature of the atonement. And if you haven't read it yet, I think you'll be surprised at the rubric under which Murray classifies the nature of the atonement. And so we'll get there next time. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for your great mercy and love. And we pray that you would help each one of us to love you more as we study this doctrine and that that love would issue forth in greater obedience and greater fruit for the glory of your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.